Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Today on our show, we have Lisa Westberg Peters, author of Fractured Land, The Price of Inheriting Oil. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. As we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, your background, maybe where you're originally from. Well, I'm not from North Dakota. I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota, and um, I'm a journalist by training. Went to the University of Minnesota, went to the School of Journalism, and worked as a journalist for a while, and then shifted for 25 years to writing children's books. Okay. Until I wrote this book. Now I'm a memoirist. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, children's books and, but, and a journalist, but uh, did you become a writer at an early age? Uh, what, yeah, what? I always loved to write. I always did. Um, I think I realized early on that that was um, the equivalent of thinking. Writing is the same as thinking, and that was the way I could force myself to think, <laughs> was to put my thoughts on paper. And, Clear writing is clear thinking. I like that that connection. Okay. Well, let's talk about your book here, The Origins of the Book. It starts out with you finding out that uh, your family has mineral rights or potential mineral rights uh, in North Dakota oil region, I guess, I'll say, and that you could inherit royalties from this land. Is, is that kind of the way you started looking at uh, this yeah. book? Yeah. The oil rights, the mineral rights started with my grandfather who did live in Williston, near Williston, and when he died, the mineral rights went to my father and his mother and his siblings. And so when my father died at the end of 2011, um, we always knew about the mineral rights, but they never amounted to much, as everybody knows. It was uh, pretty small pickings. We didn't pay much attention in the family, but when, just before my father died, <coughs> the fracking started to make a difference in the family income. And so when he died, we realized that he was the one who was the keeper of the knowledge about the mineral rights, and my mother knew almost nothing. Um, I'm interested in geology, and I'm a writer. I couldn't resist this project, so I delved right in uh, almost immediately after my father died. Okay. Well, let's uh, find out a little information, if you'll share it. With, where exactly is the land, or give us some idea of sure, where it yeah. is? And What's the current um, status of the land? It's uh, his, my grandfather's land parcels were in two areas, about 10 miles north of Tioga and about 10 miles south of Tioga, so right, just right near the Missouri River. Mm -hmm. um, he had both mineral rights and surface rights, but my family sold the surface rights in the early 1970s, so it's just mineral rights now. Interesting that they kept the mineral rights, though. And, uh, yeah, they always, I think, uh, they were always hoping their ship would come in, I, <laughs> I mm -hmm. think was the thinking, and it wasn't, you know, it just made sense to them. They were, my father and his brother particularly, were, were cautious about those things. Well, now, as I understand it, and this question talks about the history of the land, as you were talking about, how, you, how your grandfather's purchases were sort of risk-taking ventures, or... Well, he had, yeah, he had, um, I think it's a kind of a classic North Dakota story that he homesteaded in the early 1900s, um, brought his wife out, they had children, and Ev, his entire first family died of infectious diseases. Um, he started a Ford dealership and went bankrupt. This was right after World War I when ag prices collapsed. and. There was a lot of hardship in his family. He lost his homestead property. So it, it seemed like a big risk to me when I was looking back on my family history that he would again buy land, buy farmland in North Dakota after his miserable experiences with trying to make a living mm -hmm. um, in the early 1900s. So he bought land again in the, starting in the 1940s, early 1940s. And I think I was impressed by that, by that um, risk taking on his part. And one of, one of the things I discovered when I was doing the research for this book, I kept asking my mother and my uncle, the elder, elders in my family, why did Oscar, my grandfather, do that again? Why did he take that chance of buying land again after his incredible failures? 
from before and they kept telling me it was he just wanted to farm he just wanted to be his own boss he was tired of working for two old nurses at the hospital in <laughs> Williston and he was uh, the money manager the financial manager there um, but I also knew because of my geology background I knew that the parcel that was south of Tioga was very close to the Nesson anticline which is this geologic structure that the oil drillers used to look for because it trapped oil and my grandfather was certainly paying attention he was reading the newspapers he was county treasurer for a while he was a city treasurer for a while so I knew he was paying attention and finally I asked my uncle why did he buy that parcel the one south of Tioga that's right by the Nesson early Nesson drilling efforts and he said oh yeah sure he just wanted to get in on something <laughs> and to me that was part of what makes it hard for me as an environmentalist to dismiss the oil part of my heritage now because my grandfather suffered so much in his early years and my entire Swedish ancestor side suffered a lot to make it on the plains and um, he finally did. Hmm. Well, with that said, because uh, when you were doing your research, did you know all of this grow from growing up, or did you discover this as you were doing research for this I book? I knew almost nothing in my, you know, I don't know what it was, if it was collective family amnesia, or if they just were really quiet about their history, but um, they knew, my father knew almost nothing, my uncle knew almost nothing, my grandfather said almost nothing about his Swedish ancestors, and it turns out they came over um, right around the time of a mass crop failure in Sweden. I suspect they were nearly starving. And they homesteaded in western Minnesota. My great-great-grandmother died in childbirth 20 miles away from reaching the homestead. It was uh, miserable, miserable stuff. And, and many people in North Dakota have stories like that in the, on the Great Plains. Um, so yeah, it was a, for me as a writer, the great joy of working on a book is the discoveries that I make. Okay, sure. Now you just mentioned uh, you're an environmentalist. Uh, can you talk about the conflicts in your mind about uh, sort of accepting the royalties versus, versus being that conservationist? And sure, that's what the book is about, is yeah. that dilemma of having a lot of qualms about fossil fuel and the pollution that it causes and the climate change that it's responsible for, and now being part of a family that's benefiting from the extraction of fossil fuel. So that's the central question of the book. Um, okay. I reached some kind of resolution by the end. Uh, it was very difficult, um, and even as I was writing, I wasn't sure how I was gonna end the book. <laughs> so that kind of kept me going too. You know, you, you don't like to be predictable with, as a writer, and I like to think I wasn't. Um, with this, but but yeah, I would like renewables to play a larger part in society and American politics policy. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, it's a dilemma for me. Okay, well, you mentioned you started investigating uh, this after the passing of of your father in 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about the significance uh, of that event in your life? And and then I mean. Basically, that's only three years ago, so uh, how long did it take to get the book put together? It, it was crazy. It was very hard. Um, you know, when your parent dies, you're grieving, and I think this was my way of grieving, was, was to just plunge into a project like this and find a way to honor my father. Um, he was a clever man. He was a lifelong tinkerer and an inventor, a career inventor for 3M in St. Paul. And that's a thread through the book is innovation. I like to think that um, we can't innovate our way out of some of our energy problems, but we, it would, it would help. <laughs> um, innovation will help. Um, we're we're a, a, a nation of innovators. Um, that's part of the the th one of the threads of the book. Um, but I, I know my father was, uh, generally his politics were pretty liberal, but he drew the line at North Dakota oil. <laughs> mm. I know when the fracking started, 
then a couple of years we started hearing about it before he died, a couple of years before he died. And I would call him up and I would ask him, so dad, how do you feel about, you know, all the water that's being used and what about those chemicals and are you sure about this? And he never, ever wanted to engage in that conversation. And uh, he just had a pretty clear line um, between his environmental normal environmental self in, in North Dakota oil. It's like there's this big wall. Hmm. Yeah. Well, then let's talk a little bit about maybe your journeys. You, know, you traveled out to Western North Dakota, obviously, to do the research on the book. Uh, what was your impressions of what was going on there? Now, wh and what year were you out there? We, we okay. organized a family caravan um, to sprinkle my father's ashes mm -hmm. in the summer of 2012. Hey. And well, that was quite a trip. <laughs> there were 15 of us. Um, we went by train, by car, held together by cell phones, of course, and you know, that's changed everything, the way you can communicate on the road now. And our original plan was to um, sprinkle his ashes at Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Beautiful place. My father had played in his, the Williston Junior Municipal mm -hmm. Band way back in the 1930s to help dedicate, you know, the park went through various stages and I think he went down there to help dedicate that park and we thought perfect, but on the day that we were going to do that, we wanted, we had some time, so we went first to see my grandfather's oil wells and his property and there was an oil worker there and he took us on a little tour, it was amazing showed us some North Dakota oil that's fizzy with all the natural gases and there are lots of photos in the book. Um, we, I have some of the oil worker and some of the wells and and so much time passed we were all so engaged that we changed our plan and sprinkled my father's ashes right next to one of his beloved oil wells. It was a very moving experience and my son-in-law um, at the time, I was so focused on the, what we were doing that I didn't realize that all these family members were taking photos behind me. I didn't, didn't know that. And so there's a photo in, in the book that my son-in-law took. It's a pretty striking photo of my father's ashes being hmm. sprinkled over the North Dakota prairie. But yeah, we were struck by the oil patch um, activity and the trucks and the dust and the potholes and the incredible um, frenzy that's going on out there. All right, so this is 2012. Yeah. So you're, you've yet to really do any research on the book. Exactly. Well, I stayed. They all went home and I stayed for another couple weeks um, running around, talking to people. Mostly I wanted to talk to North, uh, native North Dakotans to see how they felt about the oil boom. And also, of course, to head to the Williams County Recorder's Office and get more details about where my grandfather's land was because, of course, I didn't know exactly. I did visit uh, a drill site, courtesy of a woman I met uh, in Williston, who very generously allowed me to accompany her family. Uh, that was eye-opening to see the, you know, the spread of computer screens and um, at that point they were drilling horizontally and I was struck by how the drill kind of goes mm. up and down. It's not just, <laughs> you know, I don't know how they do it. It's a marvel of, of engineering and and again, you know, you see those things and you, you have to be, because my dad was an engineer, I'm impressed by, by that stuff and it, again it makes it hard for me as an environmentalist to dismiss smart people who are doing work that they care about. Um, it's, uh, I know some of that talent can also be uh, uh, applied to renewable energy, to cleaner forms of energy, which North Dakota is also engaged in. Sure. Well, with that said, uh, just, uh, you know, and, and your position and things, you've seen some fracking. Uh, in your opinion, do, we, do you feel like we, fracking is dangerous or is the jury still out on that? I have, um, I have 
thoughts about fracking that surprised some of my liberal Minneapolis friends, <laughs> and that is that I don't truly object to fracking. I think if it's well done, if the operators are doing their job, I don't see the problem with fracking. Um, they don't always do their jobs. That's a problem when they don't. My problem is more with the global issue of fossil fuel in general and carbon emissions and how I think we need to move on. And I think um, gradually the country is going to move on. Um, if it were up to me, if I were in charge, I'd probably make it happen a little faster with some national policy changes. But, but fracking itself, if it's done correctly, I don't have a problem. And I, I talked to a fracking expert who, who was a very smart guy. He was very generous with me with his time. We sat down at the Mega Latte in Williston for a long time, we talked for a long time. I discovered that he fracked one of my mother's wells, which was astonishing. <laughs> you know, I think it's that two degrees of separation among North Dakotans and anybody that you come in contact with, you're, you dig deep enough, you're connected to them. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, here, here's a question that, you know, can you talk about the ties uh, between frac, sign, uh, frac uh, sand mining on the St. Croix and then the North Dakota? Hello. Yeah, well, in the book, I talk about how I grew up, uh, spent my childhood summers on a, in a beautiful river valley, the St. Croix River Valley, which divides Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, they're fracking, sand, uh, digging for sand now for, for fracking, mm -hmm. right next to a national park on the river. And I stumbled onto that sand mine. I didn't know it was there. I mean, this was, again, one of the discoveries I made that I write about in the book. Mm -hmm. I tried to, because I'm a sand collector, which is a little odd, I know, but I love sand. <laughs> that was one of the things I first learned about fracking was sand? They use sand? What kind of sand? I, I, I want to know. <laughs> but um, so that was one of my driving forces was to find Wisconsin frac sand in North Dakota and collect a little baggie of Wisconsin sand, which I ultimately do in the tiny town of Makoti, North Dakota, and there's a scene in the book describing that, that effort. Okay. So Wisconsin sand is making it to North Dakota, although, I, and I didn't know this before, the fracking consultant that I spoke with doesn't necessarily like sand because at the depths that they drill to in North Dakota, sometimes the sand crushes and it messes up the equipment. Okay. Uh, before we get into more questions, I think we're going to ask you to read uh, us just a, maybe a beginning of your book a little bit. Okay, sure. The book opens um, just before my father dies and he was living, my parents were living in, North, in uh, Florida at the time. So this is set in Minneapolis. It's the middle of the night. I press the power button on my computer. I'm looking for something, anything, to divert my thoughts from the fact that my father's dying. When my home page finally fills my screen and the whirly rainbow stops whirling, I go to a dignified website that might put amateur insomniacs back to sleep. Not me. The State Historical Society of North Dakota site has scads of old photos. I love old photos. More importantly, my father, a native North Dakotan, also loves them. I click through until a search window pops up. Now what? I don't even know exactly what I'm searching for. It's 2 a.m. and complex thought usually requires coffee. So I type in just one word, Westberg. It was my grandfather's last name, my father's last name. In response to the prompt, several photos pop up. Now I'm awake. Two of the photos of our <clears throat> are of my long dead grandfather, Oscar Westberg, and several other middle-aged Williston, North Dakota community leaders gathered around tables. Another is of the Williston Junior Municipal Band with my dad on clarinet and his brother on tuba. A few other photos seem irrelevant, but two photos show a sleek post-World War II sedan next to a makeshift oil drilling rig, a structure that Don Quixote could have beaten in a jousting match 
had he wandered across time and space to the 20th century in the, the American Plains. There are a few pickup trucks which probably belonged to the drill crew in the Horizons Flat. Not only does Dad love old photos, he loves North Dakota oil. From my grandfather, he inherited farmland and mineral rights, a potential cash cow that for decades was more like a cash gopher. Dad's home state used to be known for Durham wheat and silence. Today it's known for truck traffic, mile-long oil trains, and booming production of petroleum crude. I'm awake, but I still don't know what to make of the caption. Westburg oil well somewhere in North Dakota, 1954. Were the photos taken on my grandfather's wheat farm? Do oil companies name oil wells after the landowner? And who's William Shimori, the guy who took the photo? I print out the photos because dad will adore them, and I plan to fly to Florida to see him next week on Tuesday, the same day as my sister. Hmm. So that's how it starts. Well, and with that then, talk about some of the interviews you did out in Western North Dakota. I talked to, um, well, I talked to this fracking consultant. Mm -hmm. I talked to folks at the drill site, and I talked to farmers. Um, talked to a couple of, uh, I talked to a retired oil and gas attorney, which was interesting. But the farmers, I think it, they especially were interesting to me. Um, I toured around my grandfather's former property with the gentleman who owns the land now. And I would say he has a love-hate relationship with the oil industry. His mother earns royalties from, from um, oil, but he doesn't like what the oil companies do to his property. They don't always restore the land to the way it was before they um, mess with it, <laughs> especially pipelines when they put in pipelines and they don't fill it in properly and he's had some damage done to his equipment. So that scene is in the book, my conversation with, with him and his wife. I also talked to a gentleman who lives across the road from my grandfather's farm and he actually knew my grandfather. He was old enough um, to remember him. And it, I don't know, the scene was especially poignant to me because he had a lot of doubts about the oil drilling and for the same reasons that, that I have doubts. He worried, well, it's a disruptive force for him, the traffic and the, you know, the drilling and the noise. He liked his peaceful life um, near McGregor, North Dakota, and much of that was gone. Um, but he also worried about climate change. And he's, of course, a mineral rights owner, so he kept telling me several times, he told me we would have been better off without this. Hmm. So that scene is in the book, and it was uh, uh, really hard to write that scene because um, I didn't write it until after I knew that um, this farmer's name is Leanne McGinnity. He died shortly after I spoke with him of cancer. Hmm. So it was a tough scene to write. Okay. Well, <clears throat> as you know, a recent New York Times article was written um, criticizing North Dakota's political establishment of being too cozy mm -hmm. with the oil industry. Uh, what's your views or thoughts on this? Um, I should add that um, some North Dakota journalists have also written about those mm -hmm. issues. It's yeah. not just the New York Times. Sure. Um, I think, you know, I'm not an expert on North Dakota politics, but I do know that some other states uh, in their oil and gas commissions are not uh, elect composed of elected officials. And I think, I don't know if that's an active suggestion here in North Dakota, but I think that would be a good idea to remove elected officials from the Oil and Gas Commission and maybe have appointed um, people instead of people who receive campaign contributions from the energy industry and then also and then have to make decisions mm -hmm. about permitting. You know, I was going to ask you to read again, but we're not going to have time. Oh, because, But okay. I'm going to ask you the, the question people are probably thinking. Can you talk about the decision on the mineral rights that you reached near the end of the book? 
Sure. Well, I have uh, some hesitations about being specific. Uh, this is a work of creative nonfiction. It reads like a novel. Mm -hmm. So no novelist would give away the ending. But okay. I can say that uh, my dilemma is also society's dilemma. We all have, have to face decisions about fossil fuel. I make decisions on two levels. <clears throat> one is a personal level and one is a more of a national scope in which I offer free advice to our nation's leaders about how to um, help resolve the carbon emissions problem. All right. So, so we'll, <laughs> two we'll levels. <laughs> we'll encourage people then, buy the book, read it, and find out. If people yes. want, uh, where can they find the book and get more information? Um, well, I think Zanbro's Variety has had okay. it. I don't know if they have it right now. I'm headed mm -hmm. over there soon and, of course, online. Okay. Yeah. Well, Lisa, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching.